Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Science in the Age of COVID-19. Uh, today, we are extremely excited to welcome Emma Hodcroft from the University of Basel in Switzerland. You may know her better as Die Virgenjägerin, the virus hunter. Uh, Emma has worked a lot to help lay the computational foundations for the science of phylogenetics, particularly microbial phy uh, phylogenetics. Um, she has in the past, before 2020, worked mostly on HIV, flu, uh, did a big project to help get bacteria into, uh, to work well in the computational frameworks that they had been using. And most recently had been tracking enterovirus outbreaks around the world. Uh, she is the day-to-day -day leader of a project called Nextrain, established with Trevor Bedford at the University of Washington. And beyond the science, Emma does a lot of uh, other um, service organizing workshops, um, doing science communication and uh, public outreach. So. It is a fantastic pleasure. So, uh, Emma. Yeah, so good evening from Basel, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to come and speak tonight about next strain sequencing and the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. So I thought, first of all, I'd, ta I'd tell a little bit about my background. So my undergraduate degree is just in plain biology. And I then went on to do my MSc in quantitative genetics and genome analysis and my PhD in the phylogenetics of HIV. So I've spent about the last 10 years working on the phylogenetics of infectious diseases, mostly viruses with a bit of dabbling into bacteria, as was just said, to get things like tuberculosis working in next strain. Mostly I've worked on HIV, tuberculosis, and enteroviruses, and of course, since this year, I've <laughs> been working full time on coronaviruses. Now, I just wanted to touch a little bit as well onto some things that I'm really into. So I'm a huge advocate for open science, open data, and open source. So all of the next strain code is open source. And as much as possible, we try and encourage people to put their data up and make that available to everyone. Something I think that's been really highlighted by the current pandemic, because a lot of the work that we've been able to do has been possible because of scientists being open, collaborating, communicating and sharing their data. And I will touch more on this later. I'm also really into science communication. And again, this is something that I think this pandemic has really put into the spotlight. That we need to make sure that we have scientists out there that feel comfortable and are prepared to talk to the public and talk to the media about our science, because you never know when you might find yourself in the spotlight. And in situations like these, we need all the help we can get to try and combat misinformation, especially when governments can sometimes really fall down in doing that communication side, which opens the door and kind of leaves that blank space for misinterpretation. So in general, I'm a huge advocate for kind of more open and more equitable science. But today I'm going to be talking about phylogenetics. So first of all, it's probably a good idea to give a little introduction to what phylogenetics is and why it's useful. So phylogenetics is essentially a way to reconstruct and record relationships between individuals or species. And unlike virologists, people like me who do kind of molecular phylogenetics, we're more interested, we're less interested in kind of the function. So we're less interested in like, you know, this tiny mutation changes how this thing binds to this other thing or it changes the structural configuration. That can certainly play into it, but we're really more interested in kind of the bigger picture, population level change and things happening over time. But of course, when we talk about um, infectious diseases, we very rarely know all of the cases that have happened, all the people that have had that virus. And of course, what I do plays incredibly importantly, or it's, it relies incredibly on more traditional epidemiology, where we learn a lot about these diseases, but traditional kind of boot leather epidemiology, trying to survey everyone, get an idea of who's had the disease, who infected them, when that was, where it happened, that's really hard to scale up. Um, it's really time and, and personnel intensive as we're discovering with test and trace programs worldwide. So what can we find out from the pathogens themselves that lets us get some insights here that maybe would never really be realistically possible with more traditional epidemiological work, and then of course can be married with that really important more traditional epidemiological work. 
So when we think about infectious diseases, they move through populations um, by transmitting from person to person. So here the people are the red dots and the transmissions kind of connect these people with lines. And as the virus or the pathogen moves through the population, it, it does not have a perfect replication system. So it sometimes has typos when it copies its genome or mutations. Really important to remember here that mutations are a lot less dramatic than we tend to hear in the media or in the movies. Most of the time, they do absolutely nothing to change how the pathogen works, but they're really important breadcrumbs that let us actually do this phylogenetic work at all. Now, of course, like I just said, we very rarely have information about everyone who has had a pathogen. And so usually we've only sampled some proportion of the population that was infected. So here, the sampled cases are these blue circles that you can see. And we've got kind of a, a random sample through time from our overall population. Now, when we take those people, uh, we've, we've maybe swabbed them and diagnosed them with this pathogen, and we've then made the decision to sequence, so to get the genetic material out of those viruses, let's say. It's also important to remember that Sampling does not equal sequencing. So you do have to sample to get a sequence, but not all samples are sequenced. So not everyone that we could sequence gets sequenced. Um, this is an entirely other step and of course incurs you know, additional costs and processing. But for these people, let's say that we did sequence them all. And so we end up with these sequences, these genomes from the viruses. Here, they're just represented as lines. But you can see the mutations are represented on top of this by the colored diamonds that match what we can see in that kind of transmission tree over to the left. And you can start to see here how we can use these mutations to put these sequences in some kind of order. So all the sequences, uh, except for one, have this kind of red mutation. And we can tell that they're probably more closely related. And we can do this with every mutation, getting a picture of which sequences are most closely related, share the most mutations, and which ones are more distantly related. And this allows us to reconstruct kind of a basic phylogenetic tree. And so you can see here, this approximates the transmission history, but it's certainly not complete. We're missing a lot of people in the population, and it doesn't have as much detail as we, if we knew this whole tree to the left. But you can see that we definitely can see some of the patterns. And you can see in this tree that the branch length, so this kind of horizontal distance, represents the number of mutations. These ones with just one mutation are shorter than these ones with two mutations. These ones here would actually be no mutations. They'd have no branch length, but it kind of makes the tree hard to read. So I put a, a small line there just so that you can see where the letter is floating. But of course, once we have this basic tree, we usually want to do more. So some of the biggest questions we usually want to answer are things like, when and where was this pathogen in the past, and how might it have moved between dem different demographics or different places? Now, there are some pitfalls here that I'm going to really underscore, but I still think it's really important to cover how we do this and as well as as the kind of limitations of, of these procedures. So when we get one of these more basic trees, usually one of the first things that we want to do when we have, for example, viral sequences is to get what we call a time resolved tree. And we can do this because we know the time when all of these samples were taken. So we know the date when each of these people had their sample, for example, swabbed. And then we obviously have, of course, our kind of basic phylogenetic, phylogenetic tree on the left here that's just representing the mutational differences. Now we can plot the time when the sample was taken for each sample on the x-axis versus the number of mutations that we see in that sample. And you can see that we actually get a really nice pattern. We can draw kind of a regression line through that that gives us an estimate of how many mutations the virus accumulates per unit of time. And once we, excuse me, once we have this, we can combine this information with our basic mutation tree on the left and we can get what we call a time resolved tree. So in this tree, the samples are plotted on the x-axis by the date they were taken, but we use the information that we got here, the mutation rate, to then extend the branch lengths in the past to try and estimate when things have happened in the past. So for example, if this virus mutated on average about two times per genome per month, then we might estimate that this internal node here, this kind of hypothetical ancestor to the virus, when this divergence happened between these, these two sequences and these two sequences, happened about a month after A was sampled. And the whole root of the tree is probably about two months, so four mutations, that would be about two months previous to when A was sampled. So we can get estimates for when these events might have happened in the past. But one thing that's really important here is that if you notice, the samples don't lie beautifully on this regression line. They're a little bit off. 
There's noise around our estimate of the mutation rate. And this is really important because of course, the viruses don't perfectly always get two mutations you know, per month. And so when we try and go back in time, there is confidence intervals around how sure we can be that we've really narrowed that down. Over longer time periods, we can often have a lot of confidence in, in some things. So if we have a lot of samples over the last 10 years, we might be able to really confidently say, okay, this variant of the virus certainly seems to have split out sometime in 2012. But particularly when we're talking about situations like now, in a pandemic that's only been going on for a few months to begin with, then just having two mutations per month, when you put some noise around that, our confidence intervals are often fairly large relative to the questions people want answered. So particularly earlier this year, people really wanted to know, you know, when did this arrive in my country? You know, can I tell exactly when it started being imported? Well, if, the, if we only have sequences covering four or five months, and you're asking us about a particular week in February, there's very, you know, we have very little confidence that we can really say that to that degree. Our confidence intervals are usually much wider, which often isn't necessarily the answer people want. But we have to be really cautious what we say, because of course there can be, you know, real world media consequences here. If we end up conveying more confidence in what we can say about time than we really have in the data. So the next thing that we're often very interested in doing is inferring things like location. So where was the ancestor to the virus or when did it jump from one country into another country? And this is just another really simple toy example. You can imagine if we have two samples from Europe and two from North America, but the two European ones are very close together, we might infer that the European ones have an ancestor, a common ancestor in Europe. And then further back in the tree, we might say that this virus um, originated in North America and the root is in North America. And for this, we use very similar processes that we use um, to kind of make the tree kind of time resolve, reconstructing things into the past. But again, we have to be really careful here with how confident we convey our data and how much we trust that data and how much that data isn't biased. So if I take another example, Let's say we have some samples of a virus from an orange country and from a blue country. When we have all these samples, we might reconstruct a tree that looks like this and say, okay, it looks like the virus originated in the orange country and it jumped three separate times. There were three separate introductions into the blue country. But if by chance we just happen to be missing one of those orange samples, we might now reconstruct a little bit of a different story. We still say, okay, the virus started in the orange country, but now we might say there was just one introduction to the blue country. And if we happen to be missing even more samples, we really might change what we're saying. If we only had one orange sample, we might now say, well, it looks like this virus really came from the blue country and it jumped once into the orange country. Now I've shown this going from left to right because it's easier to follow kind of, kind of in your mind. But of course in real life, we're usually moving the other direction. So we usually start out with much less data and then as time progresses, if we're lucky, we get more data. But we often, especially early in a pandemic or early when we're gathering sequences, we might not really know how much data we have or whether we are getting more in the future. We're almost always undersampling. We rarely have samples from everyone. And often, particularly with time and good data from other countries, we can estimate how many samples we have one country relative to another but we might not be completely correct here and we might not be fully appreciating the samples that we're missing. And certainly we could never infer, for example, that a virus or a variant started in a country that we have no samples for, or that we might only have samples from one city in that country, might not be representing that country as a whole. So we always have to be really cautious here about when we infer these, these ancestral locations, how confident we can be that this is really what happened rather than perhaps an artifact of, of sampling or of biased data or of bias kind of collection times, these kinds of things. So why have I spent so much time kind of telling you some big caveats around these things? I think this is something that we really need to be cautious of right now at this moment in time. I like to say phylogenetics is beautifully dangerous. We're getting an unprecedented amount of attention in things like phylogenetics and viral sequencing and, and mutations, and molecular, um, molecular epidemiology. Um, you can see I searched virus sequence on Google Trends here and you can, you can see the peak caused by the pandemic. 
And when people look at these phylogenies for the first time, they're colorful, things like neck strain are really interactive. They can seem deceptively simple to read, but they're incredibly easy to misinterpret. It can seem so simple to look at one colored line, another colored line and go, okay, this is where it went from this country to this country. And people just have no idea of the, the underlying assumptions and limitations that that that, that inference is, is based upon. And even experts have made mistakes. So even during this pandemic, phylogenetic experts have said things that have conveyed more confidence in the results than we really had at the time. And these, especially early in a pandemic where some samples might be identifiable because there's not that many cases, we really have to be cautious of what this means, the real world consequences, and how these things can be interpreted by the public. When you communicate with other scientists, they often understand the inherent limitations in your work. But when we communicate to the public, we know they don't know this. And it, I think it is our responsibility as scientists to make sure that we really clearly convey what we can and what we can't know about our own data. But enough caveats, let's go to the real world. So I work for nextstrain.org, as you hopefully know by now. Um, if you haven't been to Nextstrain, I'd really encourage you to check it out. It's really cool. You can go to nextstrain.org slash NCOV slash global to see our latest builds. I think they just went up from today. And Nextstrain is a program that doesn't just do SARS-CoV-2, I should say. We actually track many different pathogens, and it originally started out with flu. It's both a website and a software package. So there's a software package behind Nextstrain that actually does the analysis, and it then makes these beautiful visualizations. And this is all open source, and we have lots of different implementations for different pathogens that you can go and have a look at. Um, but this is what powers our kind of ongoing builds for SARS-CoV-2. And of course, Nextstrain is not at all an effort by just me. It was actually co-founded by Trevor Bedford at uh, the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center in Washington and Richard Nair here at the University of Basel in Switzerland. I'm part of the Swiss group with Richard Nair. We also have a student assistant called Moira Zuber who's been critical in keeping the runs going. And we also have James Hadfield who's designed most of the beautiful visualizations and is based in New Zealand. And this kind of international spread of people worked really well for us in the early days of the pandemic because we actually were working on the build 24 hours a day, seven days a week, handing off between our respective three time zones. Luckily, we're not doing that anymore, but it did uh, mean that we were able to update every single time we got a new sequence in those, in those exciting early days when, when every new sequence was a learning opportunity. So let's go back in time a little bit to that, those early days of the pandemic. And just to remind you, this all started with 27 cases of viral pneumonia in uh, December 2019. And really quite quickly, the virus responsible was identified as a coronavirus. And about the 10th of January, the first full genome sequences of this novel coronavirus were released. And I do want to highlight here that I think this was actually incredibly important. So this really set the precedent for how we were going to conduct this pandemic. The fact that these Chinese scientists made these sequences available openly so quickly meant that from this point on, people have made their sequences available really as very in very often circumstances as fast as they possibly could and have shared them openly. And I really can't underscore enough that I think this has really made so much of the work that we've been able to do in the last few months, which is amazing for a virus we didn't know existed a year ago, possible, this open sharing. And this has continued. On the next strain front, we started our first um, build to look at the new coronavirus in the context of its family, so the nearby coronaviruses, um, in the middle of January. And by the 21st of January, we'd set up our dedicated next strain build for what was then known as NCOV, novel coronavirus, didn't have a name yet, to keep these, these at, the, at the time almost hourly, now <laughs> daily builds, updating on the new sequences for the coronavirus. And over time, the number of sequences available has absolutely ballooned. So we have over 110,000 sequences available now. You can see here the sample date is plotted in pink, so that's when it was taken from the person. And the time they actually made it up online on GISAID, the online database that allows the public access of these sequences, is in blue. So there is a delay. It's about a month on average, which is incredibly fast. If, if any of you have, have worked on sequencing, you usually have to wait a lot longer. It is getting a little harder to calculate now because people are actually going back in time and sequencing early samples, which makes it look like there's been a long delay, but it's, it's a little bit of a different scenario. But this number of sequences in such a short time is really unprecedented and quite honestly astonishing. So we take these sequences from GISAID at NextStrain and we run them and we create builds that look like this. 
Now we don't use all 100,000 sequences in our builds. This is both for computational reasons. So we run this every weekday now. We need it to finish in a few hours so we can put it up online. And also just for practical reasons. So it's really hard to navigate a tree that big. It becomes very, very difficult to, to see where you are and kind of make sense of it. It's also important to downsample because of the, the inherent bias that's in the sample. So about 60,000 of those sequences are from the UK, who has absolutely blown every other country out of the water with sequencing effort for this virus. They're trying to, I think they're trying to sequence about everyone who's been diagnosed, which is really incredible. But obviously, if we, if we ran a completely unsampled tree, the UK looks like it is kind of responsible for the pandemic, just because they have so many samples statistically a lot of other samples are linked to the UK. This is a sampling artifact rather than something that's real. But because of all of this, we keep our builds at about 4,000 sequences and we run seven of them. So a global run and then six regional builds for North, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, and Oceania. So we have these more focused builds where you can look at this. So when we first ran the sequences for the novel coronavirus, the first thing we wanted to do was to see where they actually fall in the tree. So here we've got a tree of the better coronavirus family. You can see the new SARS-CoV-2 virus in red, and it's related to Middle Eastern Respiratory Symptom, or MERS, two seasonal coronaviruses responsible for the common cold, OC43 and HKU1, and of course SARS-CoV-1 in yellow down there. Now we can zoom in on this part of the tree to look a little more, more closely at the SARS-like viruses, and when we do this, Again, SARS-1, the 2003 version of SARS, is in yellow. The novel coronavirus is in red. And you can see perhaps uh, kind of the first thing you can see is that SARS-CoV-2 is not a direct descendant of SARS-1. They're related, but not directly. Now, they are surrounded by many of these SARS-like coronaviruses in blue. These are coronaviruses sampled from animals, mostly bats, some civets, and some pangolins, that have quite a diversity, you can see, of SARS-like coronaviruses that's circulating in the wild. And one thing that's worth pointing out here is this kind of infamous, most um, kind of nearest relative to SARS-CoV-2, which is this RATG13 sequence taken from a bat. But what you can see here, this is about 96% identical, but it is still quite distinct from, from the SARS-CoV-2 samples. It's, it's not really you know, super, super close. The other thing that's really important to point out here is when we look at really zoomed in trees of SARS-CoV-2 like this one, it's really easy to get this idea that this is this virus that's just mutating like crazy and it's becoming so diverse and we need to be really worried about it. But when we look at it in the context of its relatives, you can actually see that SARS-CoV-2 is really very, very, very related to itself right now. It doesn't have anywhere near the diversity of viruses that have been circulating in humans much longer. And it compared even to its nearest relatives, it's an incredibly still, you know, a very, very similar virus. All of the samples are quite similar to each other. So that's really important to keep in mind, you know, the relative divergence of this virus compared to the other viruses that we regularly study that are in humans. Now the SARS-CoV-2 genome has about 29,000 bases of uh, positive single-stranded RNA. It's one of the largest RNA viruses, and it accumulates about two, mutation, two mutations per month per genome. And we can find this out exactly the same as in the toy example I showed you earlier. So we can plot this date of the sample along the x-axis, and then we can plot the number of mutations in a sample on the y-axis and draw a lovely line that gives us this average of about 25 substitutions per genome per year, or about two mutations per genome per month. But as I, and this is a totally normal rate for coronavirus, there's nothing you know, particularly kind of interesting or, or different about this. But as I pointed out in the toy example, you can see there's a lot of noise around this estimate. So this is what, this is what I'm talking about when I'm saying it's really important that we keep in mind the limitations of our data, because when we try and estimate when past events happen, we can definitely do this with a lot of confidence over longer timescales. We have to be really careful about over-promising and how confident we can be about when something happened. So just as a kind of mid-summary, um, when we first looked at SARS-CoV-2 samples, we could see they're from the same family as SARS-CoV-1, MERS, and two seasonal coronaviruses. Of course, SARS-CoV-2 causes a milder illness generally than SARS-CoV-1, and it's much more transmissible, at least in part because we know, of course, now that SARS-CoV-2 can be transmitted before you have symptoms or without symptoms, whereas SARS-CoV-1, generally, you could only transmit it when you had symptoms, which made it much easier to contain something we're struggling with, of course, 
us at the moment. We can see there are lots of relatives found in animals, these SARS-like coronaviruses, and of course the nearest relative is that rat G13 sequence I pointed out, and we found out of course that the, the virus was mutating at about two mutations per genome per month. But how can we actually apply this? What can we actually learn from real-time phylogenetics with SARS-CoV-2? So I'm going to walk through just a few highlights of what I think we've been able to show with SARS-CoV-2 and using NextStrain. So again, we're going to go back in time a little bit to the 26th of January. This is some of the, one of the first runs that we did. You can see we did not have many um, samples at the time. And I'm actually showing the same tree here, but in two different views. So on the left, this is the date view where we've plotted the samples by the date they were taken. And we're trying to reconstruct back in time when different events on the tree happened. Whereas on the right, this is the mutation view. So this is that kind of more simple tree that we started with in the toy example, where we're just showing the differences between different sequences by the number of mutations that they differ. Really important to always think about both of these because this, is, this um, mutation view has many fewer assumptions. And a great example of this is here at the top. You can see that these blue sequences from Wuhan and this orange sequence, they're identical. They have no differences in mutations. But when we put this through our algorithm to get a time resolve tree, you can see we suddenly have some magical structure that's popped up. This is inherent in the time algorithm. It will try and attribute you know, when things broke apart from each other, how the tree branched. But it's really important to keep in mind when this is based in actual fact when we have genetic differences that support this, and when this is essentially just kind of a random reconstruction. Here, it's random. So it's really tempting to look at these and maybe say, oh, these people are connected. We really have no evidence to support that. The sequences are identical. Epidemiologically, we might have some other interesting things, but genetically, we have to always watch out for these artifacts in our tree or these, this, this structure that may not be supported by actual genetic differences. One more thing, uh, one really important thing we can see from these early sequences, though, is that they're all really, really closely related. So you can see there's really not a lot of divergence here, not a lot of mutations. And what that tells us is that this virus has not been circulating in people very long and that it came from one source. So if we had repeated jumps from some animal reservoir into humans, it would have been in that animal reservoir for longer. And over time, it would have accumulated more diversity. So then when it jumped into humans, we would see in these separate jumps some of that diversity from the animal reservoir. We'd have a more diverse virus in humans from day one. So we can tell that this came from a single source because the viruses are incredibly closely related. We can also tell it hadn't been in humans that long because it hadn't accumulated much diversity. And so we really can know with quite a lot of confidence that this virus only jumped into humans at the end of 2019. The final thing that we could see was we knew that these two samples here from Guangdong and these three here, these were family clusters and they're identical. So this gave us a little bit of a hint that it was going to be possible to at least use genetics to get some indications perhaps about how transmissions might be progressing through the population. Now one of the most kind of famous examples of what we've been able to do with the real-time tracking and with file genetics is being able to tell this important transition from imported sequences to local transmission. So when most of your cases are just coming in from somewhere else or when they're really spreading in your community. And just from knowing your sample count alone, this can be hard to tell. So if you just have five cases in your town today, you don't know, at least just from that information, whether those were people coming back from a high risk area or whether those five people actually caught this in your town. But we can help distinguish this with phylogenetics. So here is a tree from the 28th of February. We have a few more sequences now, but I'm highlighting just the sequences from the USA. And you can see here this pattern that, that would be kind of associated with mostly imported cases in that we see, apart from a couple of instances, very little clustering. The sequences are quite far apart from each other. And this is a common sign that this is being imported from some other place multiple times, genetically distinct sequences. However, if I fast forward just a few days more to March 7th, we can suddenly see a bit of a change in the picture. In particular, we can see that there's suddenly quite a big cluster here of quite closely related sequences. And this, of course, is the little bit famous now, the kind of Washington cluster. And this is where the Seattle flu study very proudly has um, some of those members are part of next strain, started testing samples looking for SARS-CoV-2 in the population through, through samples that were collected to look for flu. And they found it. And they found signs that there were very closely related sequences from people with no travel history 
in the greater Seattle area, indicating there was ongoing local transmission, which hopefully kind of changed the game, at least for Seattle. And I would like to think that it changed it in general for the US, but I think, you know, I tend to look back a little bit hazily at history and I went looking for headlines to kind of put up and show how this was a changing point that we, we really had proof that this was circulating generally in the US population. And even though I could find one from March 10th kind of talking about how the virus is everywhere already, which I think scientists had already expected. Actually, I think it is a little surprising to go back and realize how much this message was not absorbed. So it is important to highlight kind of the limitations that even though we might be able to find something out with phylogenetics, we have to then act on that. We have to then make that meaningful across a larger area or else it's not particularly helpful. Though I think it did help Seattle. It certainly didn't help other areas where I'm sure local transmission was happening in the US. We just didn't know about it. But of course, interpreting what local transmission is can be difficult. So if I go to the 3rd of March, this is a kind of intermediate tree. And now I'm highlighting all the sequences from Europe that we had at the time. And you can see that we have this quite distinct cluster here of 11 sequences from across Europe. Is this local transmission? So is this, it's obviously not as clear as if they'd all come from the same city, like in the Seattle example. Um, but is the virus, is this spread between countries in Europe, a very incredibly connected place? Or are these independent transmissions, independent introductions from Asia, for example. And I think now we know that it, it is actually both. So this cluster did diverge in China. We know that some of these samples are directly, have directly come from China. But for the rest of them, it's probably hard for us to know, and we might never know how many of these were also just happened to be imports of a very, you know, of a related lineage from some location in China to Europe and how much of this might have been local transmission. So it's, phylogenetics does not always give us alone really clear answers as to what's going on in a pandemic. Um, as the tree has grown, we found that one way to help us kind of talk more about these, these clusters and these patterns that have emerged, so this is back to the big tree of today, we've divided the tree into what we call clades. And this, these are groups that are identified by mutations so that we can um, talk about them and kind of talk about their dynamics over time a little bit more easily. There are some other ways of doing this, most famously the pangolin lineages. These have a little bit of a different purpose. They're much smaller and they're much more based around like in in introductions to a country or circulation in a country. So they're a little bit more useful for talking about very specific outbreaks or country specific things. Whereas our clades are more designed to be kind of long-term nomenclatures that can be used to track larger overarching viral dynamics over time. Now, I just want to point out this little cluster here, this little 11 sequence cluster, what became of it? This is like its baby picture. And what it actually turned into is this, the vast majority of the tree. So all of the 20A, 20B, and 20C clades in next strain came from that little innocent 11 sequence cluster at the beginning of March. And the eagle-eyed among you might know what this is now. This is actually the G clade of the somewhat infamous D614G mutation. And I think this highlights another thing that we've been able to do with real-time phylogenetics is to track these kinds of mutational uh, uh, dynamics around the world. So there's there's evidence that the, the G mutation, the G substitution, may increase transmissibility of the virus very slightly. I think there's, you know, the, the evidence for this is increasing. It's still really hard to detangle other epidemiological effects, but what we can say really certainly is that certainly the G mutation is now uh, really overtaken D. We see very little ongoing D transmission. And the G variant arose quite early. It arose in January. It's, it's not as new as sometimes it's portrayed to be in the media. And it is the strain that pretty much most of Europe had already during the spring wave and most of the U.S. had as well. And it is essentially the, 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 the variant that is circulating now, now in um, Europe and the U.S. It's, it's by far the most prevalent variant circulating now. So I'm based in Europe. I'm a little bit biased, but I wanted to talk a little bit about what can we tell um, then zooming in a little bit on Europe. And I think in particular, it's interesting to look back now and look at the early situation in Europe. So again, talking to that tree that I showed you earlier, but this time taking all the sequences that we have now, including those that have been sampled, you know, a few months later and seeing what they show. So this is 
a tree from, from now. So we have more sequences now, you know, things that were sequenced, that were taken in March, but may not have been sequenced until a few months later. And I've cut this off at the end of February. So these are just sequences taken until the end of February. In Europe at this time, there were really only a, hun a couple hundred cases reported in Europe. But when we look at this on the phylogenetic tree and we kind of rewind time, we can see that the virus had already spread to at least 15 countries. And it is certainly undersampled. We know that sampling was not happening in a representative way across these countries. We were focused on travelers, first from Asia, then from Italy. And we were focused on people who became sick enough to go into hospital. So we certainly underestimated even in the countries that we have samples for. And there's a lot of countries in Europe we don't have samples for. That doesn't mean that it wasn't there. We're probably just missing that. But I think that this is a really great example of how we can use phylogenetics to understand kind of what was happening when we look back that we, we really didn't see at the time. And if I compare this just quickly to that tree from March 1st, this is the same one I showed you just a few slides ago, you can see the difference between the information that we had then, it was pretty difficult to act on versus the information that we have now. So we also need to be cautious with even real-time phylogenetics is not up to the day. And unless we're turning around sequences like you wouldn't believe, it is always gonna lag a little bit behind. So it's important not to overly become reliant on phylogenetics, though I think it can provide really interesting insights to make sure to kind of understand, you know, does it seem like the situation a few weeks ago is what we thought it was, possibly worse, possibly better. Um, we can see the difference in what we knew at the time and what we can know now by looking back. Now, of course, a few months later in March and April, a lot of Europe then went into lockdown, greatly restricted movement, most of the borders closed, so we might expect that this led to decreased um, transmission between countries. So might we start seeing an increase of clusters as we see countries becoming much more self-contained and those transmission opportunities kind of shutting down? Unfortunately, the virus was incredibly well circulated at this time, perhaps no surprise from the slide I just showed you. Not only that, the virus did not have a lot of diversity. This is still incredibly early in the pandemic, and a lot of the variants that were circulating were completely identical. So we have uh, this real mixing through the tree where countries are at, in Europe are absolutely interspersed with each other. They're genetically identical, and we essentially, I don't think we'll ever be able to tell which country you know, transmitted to which country. We just don't have the information to, to really unlock that. But what we can see is, is we can see some indication of clustering happening um, kind of in this uh, middle, middle of spring and late spring. And in particular, we can see this in, for example, uh, Sweden and Finland here in the orange and green. They have quite a big cluster kind of entangled with each other. And in Spain, in the kind of darker purple, we can see very distinct clusters down here and up here. And then Switzerland in light blue, we can also see, and, and Iceland in purple, we can also see some smaller clusters that indicated spread you know, within that country that didn't necessarily seem to entangle very much with other countries in Europe. Now, of course, over the summer, we've reopened borders quite a lot. Unfortunately, we've, we've shut most of them again now, but we did have a few good months there where people could really travel. So are we seeing increased mixing again because of this border opening? We have about 600 samples between July and now. Unfortunately, about two thirds of those are from Belgium, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and the UK. So we're really disproportionately sampling four countries out of the many in Europe. And um, I think that means that we have to be really cautious with how we're interpreting the data, unfortunately. So I do think that preliminarily we see some signs of mixing, we see some signs of possible transmissions that happen through summer border opening, but I'm not going to show any examples because I know the data is really skewed and I don't want this to be interpreted to mean more than, than I think we can infer at this point when we know that we're, we're missing samples from many, many countries. Hopefully as we get more data, I think it would be incredibly interesting to look into this more and see more general patterns. How much did summer opening potentially contribute to um, you know, the spread of, spread of the virus or mixing of different variants between different countries? In Switzerland, we have made an incredible effort, thanks largely to uh, the efforts of Tanya Stadler and her postdoc, Sarah, to increase our sequencing. You can see in the last few months, we've done a great job at getting many more samples. We have information at the cantonal level. These are like states in Switzerland. So we are trying to also investigate how the virus might be transmitting within Switzerland as well as outside. I'm just gonna go show a couple quick examples. This is very preliminary data. 
But just as an example of what we can look at, as I said, we can see transmissions between different cantons. We can see that there's some clustering. So this is Zurich in this blue. We can see a lot of these linked together, the same with these green ones up here. But we also see that there's mixing and connections between different cantons. We can also look at between country data. So here Switzerland is in yellow and we can see this cluster may have Swiss origin kind of early in the pandemic. Of course, it, it certainly originated way, way back in Asia and may have traveled through many other countries, but it seems like it might have diverged in the late spring in Switzerland and gone on to transmitting perhaps to the UK in orange and maybe to Latvia and Serbia in these kinds of blues and purples. Of course, we don't know if there are missing transmission links here, but I think these are nice examples of the kind of patterns, especially more generally, that we can use phylogenetics to look into. So over this summer, this has been a really crazy, uh, exciting time for next strain, and I think it's important to look at how this has worked. So at the beginning, the global picture was really important. We were interested in how this virus worked, where it came from, how it was moving to different countries, and what information we could glean about you know, imports and local transmission. And the data that we were getting from GISA, this amazing online resource where scientists were sharing their data, and the analysis that we were running multiple times a day, I think really added to that and helped people understand the state of play, you know, as new sequences were becoming available and how exciting it really was and informative it was with every new sequence, it felt like we were learning something new. But of course, this presented its own set of challenges for next train. Our web traffic increased over 7,000%. So we had challenges from really basic things like, can we keep the website online? And we also had challenges in who we were attracting to the website. We traditionally have only really dealt with scientists, some clinicians, some bioinformaticians. Suddenly the general public was coming. And so we have made some adjustments to what we show on Next Train and how much explanation we give to try and make this more accessible to the people that are coming and trying to make sense of phylogenies for the first time. We've also, of course, had to figure out how to handle large amounts of data. We are not so blessed in all of our pathogens as to have over 10, 100,000, 110,000 sequences to deal with every day. And of course, how to keep these runs going. We do this run every weekday now, and it's fairly automatic, the analysis, but it still needs a lot of checking. And any of you who work with data will not be surprised when you say that we spend a lot of our time on working on standardizing metadata and making sure that the data that's in there is correct and dates are not messed up a little bit. That takes personnel, it takes organization, and uh, it, it takes some doing. So these are all things we've had to come up with. We've also had to be careful and learn more about communicating. So we tweet every day about the new sequences that have gone up on the website. But we have had to think about how do we credit people? I mean, these aren't our sequences. We need to credit the people who actually paid for and did the sequencing. And part of what we've tried to do to make this more accessible and to help make people help make sense of what the data is showing is by doing these situation reports, which I also encourage you to check out where we walk through different trees and we try and explain what they show and what we can and can't tell about them to try and make this more accessible to the general public. But of course, now the focus has switched a little bit. We're a little less interested in global dynamics, not least because none of us can travel. Um, and we're more interested on the local level. In particular, you know, people are very interested now in how epidemics are spreading in their country, in their, in their canton, in their state, in their local area. And we have tried to help this. We've made our NCOV repository on GitHub a template repository, and we've tried to add features so that it's pretty simple to set up a run that will be focused in an intelligent way on the area you're interested in. But of course, it's a huge number of sequences. This is a computational challenge, particularly for public health labs that might not have these kinds of resources and may not even be able to run you know, open source software on Linux. So there are a lot of challenges here as well. When you, if you do get one of these next strain trees off, you know, hot off your cluster, how do you interpret this? How do you make sure that you don't fall for these, uh, these pitfalls I highlighted earlier and actually make sense and maybe have something from these sequences you can take to your public health agency or you can take to politicians to help inform what you should be doing and what's happening in your local area. So we're trying to help with this as well, but it has shown um, some shortcomings that need to be addressed in making sure that that all of this is available more equitably and that we are making sure that people have the education in the, on the ground, you know, in their countries, in their areas, so that they can make use of this data. Because just having the sequences is not enough. They have to be able to be run and they have to be able to be, um, to be interpreted. So what has phylogenetics contributed to the SARS-CoV pandemic? I think early in the pandemic, as I kind of already outlined, 
So it was really important for understanding some of the basic things, that it came from one source, that it had recently jumped into humans. It also helped us a lot in tracking that worldwide spread, confirming that, that this did seem to come from China, understanding that there were, for example, multiple introductions into Italy, that uh, there was a big outbreak happening in Iran. We didn't have any sequences for a long time, but um, through people who had a travel history to Iran, we were actually able to understand a bit of the Iran outbreak just from their samples, which clustered together and were tied together with their travel history. And of course, we were able to help identify this change from imports to local transmissions. Later in the pandemic, we've been able to better understand the early spread, how the virus took advantage of travel links and why border closure really happened too late to make any difference and how the spread was much faster and, and, and spread through those travel collections much more quickly than we, than we realized and how well mixed it became so quickly. And now I think the real focus is on better understanding our local outbreaks. Could we be doing more with phylogenetics? I think this is a really, the big question is how much more effort we want to put into sequencing. Early on, just a few sequences globally were incredibly informative. Of course, it's easy when you know nothing, anything is worth it. Um, but of course, even just having a few sequences helped us understand how the virus was spreading locally, how much diversity there was, and what we could pick up from this data. Currently, however, you know, sequencing efforts are quite different between different countries, between different states in the US, between different regions in different countries. Um, and this does limit what we can do. So for example, the mixing over the summer in Europe, I think this is incredibly interesting and it could be very informative for, for the future when we want to open borders again. But we need samples from every country, at least a few. For this, just a few sequences from each country would probably go a long way. But of course, if you really want to understand your local epidemic, that's going to take a much more long-term and a much bigger commitment to doing sequencing to be able to actually trace things you know, through your country. Just 20 sequences a month isn't probably going to do it, especially if you get them all from one town, for example. There needs to be more organization there. And of course, as I said, we need to also expand access both to the sequencing technology, the funding, and to making sure that we're educating people who can interpret this. And I think one final question we have to keep in mind is, how much of these insights might actually then be able to be acted upon by government. So we have situations right now in the pandemic where we know a lot about how to contain this virus and it doesn't take phylogenetics to figure it out. But knowing that and interpreting that is a much more complicated question. Politicians have to balance this against economics, against the general will, against their interest in remaining a politician in office. And so it's not just about if we know it, we can do it, which I think was my naive expectation um, as you know someone who just was interested in molecular epidemiology of infectious diseases before the pandemic it's also is finding this out going to lead to things that not only could be uh, implemented but that will be implemented can we actually convey this in a way that we can act upon it if we have information that can be acted upon and can we make sure in the future that these insights are worth getting so that we can actually do something about them and hopefully you know uh, help prevent further transmission and, and in the end, you know, prevent deaths and hardship caused by such infectious disease outbreaks. But I don't want to end on a disappointing note. So I think it's important to remember that in so many ways, the pandemic has exposed a lot of cracks in our systems, but it has also exposed hope. We have over 110,000 public sequences from over 112 countries around the world. That is amazing and we've never done it before. And it is because of a global effort, an open effort by scientists, and it is a global success. And this has not just helped phylogenetics, this has helped vaccine research, understanding survival structure, drug development, virology, and so much more. These sequences have been a lot of what has allowed us to make the progress that we have. And it is amazing progress in the last few months from a completely unknown pathogen to where we stand today. We are learning so much so fast and a large part that's thanks to screens like this that you're looking at today, Zoom meetings, Slack conferences, overnight emails, sharing of data, sharing of reagents, sharing of analyses. And I think the message that I would like to leave today, even though it's not directly related to phylogenetics, is that we need to keep this going. We need to try and harness this energy and this goodwill and take this forward so that it's not just about this pandemic, it's about what we can do for infectious diseases in a much longer term 
um, time frame than that, and really for science. I think that we do better science when we work this way and when we try and overcome those individual kind of goals. And instead, we're working together, we're sharing more openly, and we can make progress standing on each other's shoulders. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for listening. I'll once again flash up the incredible Next Strain team and encourage you to go have a look at Next Strain, check out our builds, check out our websites, and check out our situation reports. And I'm more than happy to answer your questions. Thanks, Emma. Thanks for the very clear presentation. Um, I can certainly appreciate the power of molecular phylogenetics after your talk, uh, especially with respect to pathogens and at the time of this pandemic. Uh, I know you have a hard stop, so let's get to the questions right away. Um, let me ask you this. Three strains of coronaviruses have emerged since the turn of the century. We have the SARS classic, the MERS, and the SARS-CoV-2. So have you or the next strain team studied the phylogeny of the different coronaviruses? If so, how do they compare? For example, in terms of their spread, the mutation rate? Um, yeah, so the mutation rate of most of the coronavirus family is pretty sim similar. It's this two, on average, two mutations per genome per month. That's pretty common across the coronavirus family. Um, these viruses have pretty different histories. So. Uh, the seasonal coronaviruses have been circulating in humans for a longer period of time. So they are somewhat probably, most people have had them. They seem to circulate pretty globally. They've settled into quite a comfortable pattern of infecting people. If you're interested in knowing more about this, actually, amazingly coincidentally, our new preprint just went up online, and I think I'll tweet about it soon if I, I don't think I have yet, but it'll, it'll be on Twitter soon, and you can read more about what we know about seasonal coronaviruses. Things like MERS and, and SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 jumped into humans much more recently, and so they have a different amount of diversity. SARS-1 is no longer circulating. We, we managed to cut that down completely, and so its, it's history phylogenetically is very short. Um, SARS-CoV-2, I think one of the things that is to remain to be seen is if this is going to become endemic, and if so, how much it will reflect similarities to, for example, these seasonal coronaviruses where we see these, these seasonal patterns. I think that'll be really interesting to see if it happens. Interesting, thanks. Lauren, did you have one? Have yeah, it, Emma, that was fantastic. Um, I've got a bunch of questions. Um, <laughs> can I start by asking, um, uh, how much do you guys coordinate with GISAID in terms of like what your um, situation reports contain? Because I, I looked at, you know, and they have, they're fairly different presentations. Uh, I'll give you an example. Like, so GISAID is uh, tracking mutations in the probe and primer binding sites. Mm -hmm. And some of those have been pretty concerning. <laughs> Like we had Joe DeRisi on last week and he had direct experience with a um, one city that was not one of the, the probe pairs was failing. Um, and so then they sequenced and they're like, oh crap, we need to change the probe pair for that. So, uh, you know, for, for instance, uh, so why, why don't you guys include that sort of analysis? So we, on next strain, we don't. It's mostly a matter of that this is just really complex information that's kind of hard to present on a tree, though we are actually working on trying to incorporate. What I can say is that, so we have kind of, uh, if you go to clades.nextstrain.org, we have our mm -hmm. tool that originally we started this to help people just drag and drop fastest sequences on. You can assign, you can find out their next strain clade. But additionally, it does some quality control. And it actually, like as of last week or a week ago, it looks for primer, uh, it looks for those primer sites and it will flag any mutations for you. And we're hoping to now incorporate this into the tree. But it is really difficult. There's a lot of different primers out there that people use and it's hard to kind of know what to flag up because to the average user, you know, the fact that the primers in one town have a thing is not really useful and we don't know who's looking at the site but certainly the all of this data that we generate is available through GISAID like all of our raw files that hopefully can help people look into this kind of thing if they're interested 
Excellent. Next, we had an audience question. I think Sarada is going to. Yeah. Andy, uh, could you please unmute yourself, Andy? Yeah. Hi. Yes. Thank you. It was a wonderful talk. Uh, I was just going to ask if you could direct all the global sequencing efforts for SARS-CoV-2 surveillance. What would you do differently? Where would you? How would you marshal the global resources to you know, sort of maximize the sequencing benefit for for this pandemic? Yeah, so that's a really great, great question. Um, and I think, I mean, I certainly wouldn't want to take away sequencing efforts for other important things, but if we could say that I had a big pot of money just for SARS-CoV-2, I mean, I think one thing that I would really focus on is to try and get samples from places where we have no samples, but we know there's been an outbreak or where we know that the samples totally do not represent that outbreak. So a great example of this is Iran. We have six samples from Iran and they've had a huge outbreak. We have 123 from Mexico. That does not reflect their outbreak. We also have a lot of situations where sampling efforts were kind of good in the early days and then we kind of have nothing for months. So, you know, I know some states in the US, you know, really got things going in the spring, but most of the South, their outbreak was kind of over the summer and we have no sequences from their biggest outbreak. This is a big limitation in maybe helping those states see what was going on. Um, and so I think I would really focus on trying to make sure that we're getting a few samples at least, you know, every month from all the places. I mean, it depends how much money I have, I guess, but ideally kind of everywhere that we know has an ongoing pandemic and particularly maybe an increase in sequences, because I think this would help us kind of help countries keep an eye on their own pandemics and maybe be able to see some of these dynamics, particularly in places like Europe, where there could be, or there could have been transmission between different countries. Andy, are you good, man? Yes, that was great, thank you. <laughs> hey, Emma, let, let me ask you another um, behind the scenes question. Um, you mentioned the metadata that you have associated with each sequence. Can you give us a hint of what made metadata people are submitting? Excuse me, sorry. Don't worry, it's not coronavirus. It's me not. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that's another really good question. So in general, what we ask, so the, the metadata we require to be part of a next strain build is that we need to know where it was taken. So at least country level data, we really like it if it can go a little bit more than that, but at least country level data. And we need the, obviously a sequence. It needs to be good quality, at least 29,000 bases. I think 29,000 bases. And, um, and then we need the date that it was collected. So not like the date it was sequenced or the date you put it on GISA. This is really important because as you so in my talk, that's how we calibrate our, our mutational rate. So if everyone's giving random days, it, it, it doesn't work. Apart from that, everything's optional. We do sometimes age, we sometimes get gender, we sometimes get something about hospitalization or sy symptom status. Unfortunately, this is all free text. So it's really hard to read into because characterizations for what made you be hospitalized vary hugely. And of course, you know, cough could mean, <laughs> it could mean, you know, coughing up blood. So we can't really work with the symptom data. One thing that we have incorporated that can sometimes be exciting is travel histories. So particularly mm -hmm. in the epidemic, we were able to put where people, if, if they know they've been exposed somewhere else, we were able to put that in. And that's what helped us uncover this interesting Iran patterns where the people were from Australia, England, Canada, but they'd all been to Iran and their sequences fall closely together. So I think that's one piece of metadata that we've been able to really exploit and, and use in interesting ways. Yeah, I mean, I personally, I think the most interesting metadata over the next couple of years is going to be treatment regimen, because, you mm -hmm. know, I don't think it's necessarily been under much selective pressure yet, but if we start hitting people with vaccines and antibodies and drug treatments, it, you know, we're going to have to worry about escape mutations and that would definitely. be really cool to have. Yeah. And definitely if this is something that continues on, which I think unfortunately it's looking like it will for the next few years, yeah. this is exactly the type of thing that we're really well suited to do at next strain. So we already do this for flu, for example, we look out mm -hmm. for, you know, drug resistance for Tamiflu and we also look out for mutations that affect the efficacy of vaccines. So we are ready and waiting for to monitor this kind of stuff for the next few years, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, and I think Sarada had one more and then we'll let you go. Uh, well, um, 
So based on your phylogenetic analysis, um, do you think the various control measures like border closing, lockdown, and so on, had they been effective in controlling the spread of the virus? So border control measures, I think this one, it's, it's a tough question to answer because I do think that at the time, um, the big problem with border control measures is that they could be effective if you knew when to put them in. But I think what I hopefully highlighted in my talk is that we just don't know when that is at the time. And by the time we think there's a problem, it's too late. And that's why border measures don't really help, particularly in kind of stopping the spread of an early pandemic, because you're never going to put them in when you actually need to. Everyone would think you're crazy and overreacting. And by the time you finally do decide to do it, it can detract from the fact that the virus is probably already in your country. You just don't know it yet. You can kind of be a false sense of security. Now, at this point in the pandemic, the game's changed a little bit. It's about countries trying to keep their own epidemics under control. We're much more aware of what's going on around us and in our own countries. And it's more a question of, are we going to compromise our own strategy of suppression, perhaps, you know, or, or control or eradication by letting people from more where, countries where there's more virus, more transmission come in? I think this is where we've unfortunately maybe missed a bit of the boat in Europe over the summer. We really could have followed this. We really could see you know, not just from people reporting, but from the genetics, how much mixing there was through opening borders and how much it was maybe, you know, I think there's a possibility this was talked a lot about in the media. How much was it really tourists and how much is it just resurfacing of the viruses that we never managed to get rid of? And I think that is, you know, that's important. So I think border control measures can play a role, but not maybe in the most obvious ways that we think about it. And I do think it would be helpful to quantify how much this is a problem in different situations and how much we really need to be focusing on just controlling any spread, whether it came from somewhere else or whether it came from our own backyards. Um, as far as lockdowns and things, again, I think in the early days, we knew very little about this virus. We knew very little about what it was going to take to contain it. And with, with cases and deaths skyrocketing the way they were in many countries, lockdown was an incredibly reasonable option. I think now we could control this virus without lockdown. I think there's a lot of countries that have shown this. But it does take a real prioritization and a real dedication to making sure that you've scaled up testing and that you've scaled up tracing. And countries that have really invested in these have been able to maintain fairly normal lives, whereas countries that have tried to kind of push through this have been hesitant to implement any steps at all for fear that this is you know, infringing on freedoms or people's convenience. They have often suffered because the more you delay in trying to control the virus, the harder it is to get it back under control. So these countries, I don't know if they'll need to resort to lockdowns, but I don't think there's any reason for with what we know now that a country should have to go into lockdown. We can do better than that. And I actually think it's really important that we keep demanding better. I think at the moment, particularly yesterday when we woke up to this news of, or no, this morning when we woke up to this news of 1 million deaths hit globally, my dad messaged me and said, you know, I think the world is out of ideas. We're not out of ideas. And it's so important we avoid that kind of defeatist mindset. We can do better and we need to demand that our governments do better so that we can all go back to a more normal life. And we need to avoid this false dichotomy between the economy and, and you know, life, you know, lockdown or everything's open. That's, that doesn't need to be the choice. We can have a middle ground that works extremely well, but it's gonna take some investment that I think unfortunately a lot of countries aren't making. And I'm happy to stay on for a few more minutes if there's more questions. I'm happy to stay on for 10, 15 more minutes. But if that's all the questions, I'm also happy to go. Uh, okay, in that case, oh. one last audience question. The viruses mutate all the time. You've seen this. Uh, so how concerned should we be about these mutations really affecting the function of the virus and the activity of the virus? For instance, what's your take on the DG, sorry, D614G mutation? Yeah, so this is, this is a really good question because this is a really nuanced question. So I think in general... We never know going in which of these mutations is important or which aren't. But the virus does mutate all the time, and we we are we, you know we have something that's spreading exponentially to the, around the world to naive populations. Often there might be one introduction or one one introduction that was followed by a, a mass kind of spreading event. That there's lots of opportunities there where one virus could happen to have some variant then, you know, that was just the one that went to the conference that a thousand people were at that went home and went to parties. That variant is now your most common variant, but it's not through anything 
actually caused by that mutation. It's just because of the epidemiological circumstances that followed. This is so hard to detangle because of course we rarely know all of that. And of course there's other things, you know, like the, the criteria for hospitalization or who you're testing, this changes over time and it might be really changing what you actually see in the data just because of your detection is different rather than the virus is different. So you have to be mindful of all of this and this makes these things really hard to detangle. I think, um, there's a lot of scientists who are looking at a lot of the variants out there, and I actually will be surprised if we totally miss something that is influencing the virus, considering how many scientists are absolutely laser focused on looking for any signs of this kind of thing. But I think the really important thing here is, again, we have to keep in mind that we ourselves are under a microscope as scientists right now. And when we get up and shout that there's an alarming new mutation and it is spreading through the population and the virus is gonna get around your mask, People pick that up and they see headlines and they do not have the education to decide that for themselves through no fault of their own. They're not scientists. They're busy doing other important jobs. Um, and so we as scientists need to be really mindful how we express the uncertainty and the other options for how this mutation might have arisen. And unfortunately, this isn't the last we're going to see of this. We will have more mutations in the future that will get attention. And I think we all just need to be really careful how we present that. For, G6, for D614D um, in particular, I think that there is mounting evidence that there could be a small increase in transmission here um, from the cell cultures and from the epidemiological data. But I do think it's also important to remember that these two variants um, kind of passed through quite different tracks early in the epidemic and, and early in the pandemic that also very likely might explain why one rose to more prominent. So I would maybe say that it, it, it could very well be a mix of both, a small increase in transmission that, that I'm certain is nothing to worry about on a person to person basis. This is a population level change and some different circumstances in when these variants emerged and kind of the populations that they got into at the time. Awesome. So Emma, since you, since you volunteered, I've got one more. Yeah. Um, so this, this one's a bit philosophical. Um, uh, so it's about a, um, a putative type of mutation. And I'm wondering if you have seen any evidence of this in any of the other microbes that you've looked at. And that is, does a do you know examples of a virus or a bacterium or what have you where the mutation rate itself changed through, I mean, so for SARS-CoV-2, I would postulate, well, if you broke the three prime exonuclease activity, you know, probably going to generate many more mutations. For other microbes, it could be any number of explanations. Has this thing, has such a thing been noticed before? So I can't answer that question completely because I don't know if it's been noticed before. In the, in the viruses and pathogens I've studied, I haven't heard of such a thing. I'm, it's certainly not something that's happened so often that it's common knowledge. In general, I can imagine that there would be like, most of these viruses, the mutation rates are, are fairly conserved within their larger family. And so that implies that there's some pressure happening to keep that mutation rate where it is. It's that, that sweet spot for that virus between mutating enough to generate novel variation that might get you out of sticky situations like antibodies, but not going so crazy that you make much of non-functional viruses and go extinct. Um, so I imagine that that is fairly conserved or we'd see yeah. more variation like within families, whereas we actually, I mean, of course, there's, there's always an exception to the rule, but in general, we find this is fairly conserved within, within families. Certainly for coronavirus, that's the case. Yeah. I figured yeah, I can't so. speak just, to whether it's ever happened. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it can, it, it happens in humans. The, the genomics mm -hmm. of uh, the genetics of haplotype size among various ethnic populations is complicated, but is being worked out. Um, mm -hmm. And some of them make sense, but you know, we have a lot more moving parts than, than SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> so. Yeah, and certainly we see an amazing range of mutation rates across viruses, you know, as 
as a group, there's a lot of variation there with different strategies by different viruses. And that certainly speaks to that there, there are multiple sweet spots, depending on your strategy, depending on your immune reactions, depending on all sorts of things. Um, but yeah, I, it's an interesting question of if you seem to have kind of found one, how hard is it to find another one? That, that, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, well, now we'll let you go, Emma. That was truly amazing. And well, thank you guys so much again for inviting me. It was a pleasure thank you for joining us. Pleasure to answer your questions. <laughs> yeah, and uh, keep up the good work. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Be safe. <laughs> thank you. Bye.